title of our lesson today is Do No Harm, and we are on the sixth of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, as it was translated earlier on. Thou shalt not that you commit no murder, as it's translated sometimes today. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Do no harm. Have you ever found yourself in a situation in which emotions begin to run high and people, maybe even you, yourself, uh, began, responded poorly? I have at different times. Most of us have. But what happened at that time? Where, why, why the change sometimes? And have you ever seen the effects of hate and anger in your life or in the lives of those around you? I have. If I don't forget it, we'll come back to that in a bit. And I'll talk to you a little bit about a hatred that I developed one time. But right now, let's get on into the meat. Exodus 20, 13, you shall not murder. That's all it says. None of thou shalt not kill, but you shall not murder. Notice the difference there. In the original, in the King James, they translated that kill. And many times people have taken that to mean kill in war, kill in, in capital punishment, many different things like that. But there were very strict rules laid down by the Israelites, by God for the Israelites, regarding how they were to conduct themselves in time of war and if capital punishment was merited, exactly what it was merited for. But primarily, we see the difference here when you think about the difference between the words kill and murder. Many times people accidentally kill someone else. And it is truly an accident. They didn't intend to do it. They never set out to do it. And it was an accident. We cannot call that murder. But murder is a deliberate attempt. And we're going to talk, we're going to touch on today some of the different ways that we can murder someone else. Uh, there are different differences to that besides actually taking their life away from them. This was the sixth commandment given to the people. And murder is extreme. If we're not careful, we'll just kind of skim over this one and decide, well, there's not, I'm not going to commit murder, so I don't have to pay attention to it or any of that. But in the Gospels, Jesus himself declared that hatred toward another person married the same judgment as murder. That's pretty powerful. If we hate someone, we have we are doing the same as murdering them. So let's let's carry that thought forward into the lesson today. The King James, as I mentioned earlier, reads, Thou shalt not kill. More modern translations almost always say you shall not murder. Let's see. This change in translation attempts to explain and perhaps place scenarios in which murder might be justified in a better light than we would think them to be. If we look at these things closely, though, we may not have to make a change if we really understand what the words mean. Common sense seems to indicate that there could be a reasonable distinction between uh, legal and illegal killing. Is it necessary sometimes in time of war to kill the enemy? Yes. Is it necessary sometimes in order to defend your own life to kill someone else? Yes. We'll uh, find in a, in a bit an example uh, in the later in the Old Testament where the Jewish people went out and they were given the command to go and kill 
where they were under fire, where their enemies were trying to attack them. But firstly, as I said, common sense seems to indicate that there is a difference between kill and murder. Second, modern thought that we have today represents a, a significant development upon what the Bible says on a number of issues. It's not just this commandment. But even within the pages of the Bible itself, we can find this kind of development taking place. And third, Jesus himself talked about the commandment about killing. And we might then look at his words, what Christ said about it, as a, an ideal to strive for. As I mentioned earlier, in many cases in modern countries, it is legal to kill someone to save your own life or the life of someone around you when someone is, is taking that out. If you go to Esther, the 8th chapter, the 11th verse, I believe, and the 9th chapter, if you look at the 16th verse, you will find where the people of Israel were commanded to kill. And in one point it says that there were like 75,000 um, people killed by the Israelites in one day because they knew there was an uprising coming and these enemies had sworn to kill all the Israelites and they were killing them first in, a, in an effort to protect their own lives and the lives of their wives and children. So that's where, if you want to go, if you want to see some of that, read the 8th and the ninth chapters of Esther. What does the consistency, and from, the, and from Genesis all the way through Exodus and Leviticus and all the way up to the Gospels, there's a consistent theme that reveals what God's heart is toward human and uh, towards the preservation of life. I'm sorry. Sometimes with my glasses, I can't see like I should. But we want to try to figure out also, why is life so precious to God? And it seems like that if we, if we follow this lesson today, perhaps we can uncover some reasons why life is so precious to God. The second portion of our scripture today is in 1 John, the third chapter. And I'm going to read the 11th and 12th verses first. We're again, 1 John, the third chapter, 11 and 12. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. See, here we go, all the way back to Genesis. The same message carries through. Love one another. Love one another. Care for the other. Then in the 12th verse, it says, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. We're being told here, don't be like Cain. Cain and Abel, and that part of the story of the Bible was way before the Ten Commandments. But even back then, it was known that it was not right to kill someone. John reminds us of the heart of God's command in this scripture, to love one another. Most of us cannot even imagine going so far as to commit murder. It, 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 it's beyond me to figure out how I could ever be so upset with someone that I, would, that I could murder them. Now, in self-defense, yes, I believe I could take care of myself. But in just to decide that I, I need to kill him and, and go and do it, I, I just can't do that. I can't imagine me doing that. But there is a lesson for us to learn here. How does resistance to the Lord's direction and counsel, excuse me, how does resistance to the Lord's direction 
and casual indifference, not counsel, but casual indifference to the power of sin lead us to previously unimaginable acts. Did you get what I just read to you there? How, and, and this is what I want to attempt to explain some of, but how can we, how does indifference, how does it play a part? I think we'll find that it does. How many of you know someone who now lives in, in a dramatically different way from what they were taught and once believed? Probably if we, if we took the time and we searched our memory, we would find someone. Sometimes it's in our family. Sometimes it's someone that we've known for a long time outside the family, and we realize they have changed. Did they change gradually or suddenly? Most times, if we really analyze it, we'll find that they changed gradually. Now, I want to read that statement again to you that I read to you a minute ago. I'll try to read it right this time. How does resistance to the Lord's direction and casual indifference, that's on our part, resistance to what God tells us and within ourselves indifference to the power of sin lead us into previously unimaginable acts. We all know people that have done that. I know people, perhaps we have done it ourselves. There are, there are areas of my life that I could tell you about. God has forgiven me for them, but I recognize when I look back on them from this side of the action, that the reason why I reacted the way that I did was because I had just grown casual about my relationship with God and just not just been casual about my relationship with others. And it happens to us if we're not careful. This is one of the main points that, that struck me this week when I was studying for this lesson. Is how easy it is to slip into sin. We don't set out. Hardly any of us set out, wake up one morning, get up and say, well, I think I'll go sin today. We don't do that. It's a gradual erosion of our beliefs, a gradual erosion of our resistance, and gradually we fall into sin. And folks, we need to be careful about that. It's easy to read the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. It's easy to read that one and say, oh, that's a piece of cake. I'll never do that. But if we're not careful, we will and we can sin against God by casually just being indifferent to the power of Satan in the world. He doesn't, he's got no place besides this world, but he is powerful in this world. Cain's lack of righteousness was revealed by his treatment of his brother. He didn't really care. Cain didn't care about the fact that God created Abel, that God made Abel to begin with, that God felt that Abel was worthy of his uh, creation. He didn't care about any of that. And he showed his righteousness. What does our treatment of others reveal about our righteousness before God. Sobering thought. And it may only be the person that we run into one time in our lives, behind the counter somewhere, serving us with something. But how we treat them and how we, we respond to them, and <laughs> it's easy enough to get aggravated at people behind the counter these days because so many people no longer seem to care about giving you a good job or doing a good job for you or giving you good service. 
They just don't care. They don't seem to care anymore. And it's easy to get frustrated with them. But think for a moment how easy it would be if you were God to get frustrated with yourself. I know. God didn't create me with enough patience to put up with me as long as he's put up with me. You, you see what I'm saying? Or trying to say is our righteousness is a reflection of how we treat others. Our relationship with God, we have a relationship with God this way. We have a relationship with others this way. But our relationship with God is dependent upon our relationship with others also. And it's borne out. How we relate to God is borne out in how we relate to others we come into contact with. The basis of this commandment, the sixth commandment, is that all life, notably human life, number one, all human life has its source in God. Number two, all human life belongs to God. And number three, all human life is valuable to God. Number one, it all comes from God. Number two, we all belong to God. Number three, we're all valuable to God. And you may say of yourself that I'm not valuable. And you may allow Satan to convince you that you're not valuable. But you're valuable to God. He would not have created you if you weren't valuable to him. So let's carry this out in our relationship with others also. This one is pretty easy to say. Number one, I'm valuable to God. God is, my source is God. I'm valuable to God. And number two, I belong to God. My source is God. I belong to God. I'm valuable to God. Those three things. But when we realize that that our relationship with God that way affects our relationship with others this way. Our horizontal relationship, if you will. There is a difference there, folks. And it's going to show up. Our relationship with others here is going to show up how our relationship with God here is. Enough said. I got to wondering this week, <laughs> how long would Adam and Eve lived if they had not sinned? Did God intend when he created Adam and Eve, did he intend for them to live forever? Now, I know you purists are going to tell me, hey, the Bible teaches that we're going to live forever in heaven with him. But did God intend for Adam and Eve to live forever in the Garden of Eden? I don't know. It's way beyond my pay grade. So I can't tell you the answer to that. But is it perhaps possible that God's intention was for Eden to be a heaven on earth? And maybe that's what he intended when he created the world? And he placed Adam and Eve over the world. Did he intend for it to be forever and ever and ever for all eternity? And then their sin, did that cause us a hiccup in God's plan? And now I think I said last week, I reminded you of the old saying about the, the 80 years or 100 years, whatever, however many years we live here on this earth. It's just kind of spending one night in a hotel in the in the time frame of eternity so maybe we're just we're sent here for a little while and then we're going to go into our own eden whatever that is life is not merely for human beings to use as they will because they are not god 
We can't judge others. We can't take others' lives because we are not God. Human beings do not have the authority to take life on their own. Now, okay, how do we how do we justify capital punishment? Well, Israel's use of capital punishment was limited and specified in particular ways. And I'm going to read some scripture. It wasn't in the lesson this week, but I, I ran across it and I want to read it to you. It's the 21st chapter of Exodus, the, let's see, 12th through the 17th verses, five verses, six verses, I guess, out of the 21st chapter of Exodus. And it reads this way in the NIV. Anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are to flee to a place that I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. Anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the action has been sold, excuse me, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. They had some pretty specific rules and regulations, and they had capital punishment. Moses set up capital punishment for the children of Israel. Let's go back to 1 John 3 again, the 13th through the 15th verses. Remember, we just read about Cain and Abel. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Pretty powerful scripture. And I mentioned earlier that my, if I could remember it, I'd come back to this part about hating someone. 15th verse, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. In 1981, after my brother was killed Christmas of 1980, I developed purely a hatred for the man who had killed him. And I devoted too much of my time and my effort to hating the man who killed my brother. And finally, I got convicted after I don't know how many months now. But I finally got convicted that first of all, I was not hurting the man. Secondly, I was hurting myself. Thirdly, I was hurting my family by developing that hatred. And folks, I found out that a Christian could hate. I, I, prior to that, I was naive and I thought if you were really a Christian, you never could hate someone. I found out different. Now, theologically speaking, how much was I Christian because I was hating the guy that killed my brother? I don't know. All I know is that God healed me of it. God saved me from it. God took care of it. He took it away from me. But it took a long time in prayer before God took that hatred away from me. And here in 1 John, the third chapter, we're finding some of this. I, for whatever reason, I didn't run across the scripture then. I don't know why I didn't. Perhaps it would have helped me. Perhaps not. Perhaps, I don't know. But John is very adamant here in this book of 1 John in saying we cannot hate. We have to love everyone. Proof of our citizenship in the realm of life, that is in the realm of being a Christian, is evidenced by our love for others. 
proof of our citizenship in Christ's life is evident by our love for others. John warns, warns the world, or that the world, and that when he talks, when John talks about the world, he's talking about humankind will hate us. Look at our political situation today. People are literally at each other's throats over this election that's coming. We heard a wonderful message last Sunday by Pastor Sean regarding how to vote, why to vote, when, not, not who to vote for, but how we ought to consider and what we should consider when we were voting. And it was a wonderful message. And, but the world hates believers just as some, not all, but some Democrats and some Republicans hate each other. The world hates Christians. When you're really, truly a Christian, the world will hate you. John is warning us here. This is going to happen to us. Why is hate evidence that someone does not have the presence of Christ residing within? Perhaps there's some of the answer to my question a few moments ago about myself in that time, that six months or so that I spent hating the guy that killed my brother. I let the, the grief, the upset, however you want to say it, I let that drive out the Christ-like principles. And in effect, by my actions, I told Christ, I don't want you, not now. I want to be left alone to, to nourish this hatred. And folks, it almost got to that. I shudder now when I think about it. That was in 1981. That soon will be 40 years. And man, I think when I think about how I came so close to walking the wrong path for this 40 years, if I had developed that. We need to search ourselves every day. We need to search ourselves and decide whether or not there are feelings within us that we don't need, that we don't, that, that, that are not consistent with being a true Christian. The 12th verse. Let's go back to that again. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did his murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. John was warning the readers by urging him not to become like others who do not love their fellow believers. Abel was Cain's brother. How much closer can you be than that? We have to be careful in our relationship within the church. It's too easy because we get led into it, but it's too easy to be critical of what someone else is doing, of how they are living, of what they are doing. It's just too easy to do that. It's too easy to remember. Hmm. I remember 10 years ago what he did. I remember 10 years ago what she did. I remember 20 years ago. Some of us are old enough. We could say 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years ago. We could still remember. We could still hang on to that. And we could develop that hatred still for the people we're around every day. Can't do it. There's a commandment for that. I, If I was going to retranslate the sixth commandment out of Exodus. I would tell him, hey, don't look at your brother with any evil intent in your heart whatsoever. I wouldn't just say, don't kill him. Don't murder him. I just say, don't look at him with evil, any evil intent in your heart whatsoever. Let's go on real quickly to the last two verses of 
this scripture out of 1 John. The 16th, or I'm sorry, the three verses, the 16th through the 18th verses. <laughs> I subtracted 16 from 18 and came up with two instead of remembering the 16th verse was in there too. <laughs> But 16th verse reads, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Now, this is where the old boy sometimes said, Preacher, you're getting a little too close. You're walking on my toes now. <laughs> because this, could, this is cutting close to home. Listen to this one. We do not define love according to our own preferences, opinions, or convictions. We know love through Christ's submission to death for our sake. We don't define love by what we do or our opinion or our convictions. I can have different convictions than, than those of you that are, that are listening to this now. And if you don't have the same convictions, I can't say, I'm not going to love them. They don't have the same conviction. We, had, we can't do that. But John told us we know love through Christ's submission to death for our sake. That's pretty powerful. Pretty doggone powerful, folks. <clears throat> John makes it painfully clear that apathy toward the needs of others is an act of indifference. Now, I'm really going to start stepping on toes, my own included. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. If we're just apathetic toward others, and we have indifference toward them, that's not right either. When I was reading this and studying this, I was reminded of John Donne, the English poet from around 1570 to... 1630, somewhere in that neighborhood. And he wrote one poem, No Man is an Island. And most of you probably studied, I studied in high school, and it really stuck with me. And I, I even got a copy of it because I want to finish up with, with working on it here just for the next few minutes. No Man is an Island entire of itself. Each is a part of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thine own or of thine friends were. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, sin not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Now, I did find out in, in looking this up, and I didn't realize it before, that John Don was an Anglican priest. He had been a Roman Catholic priest, studied for the ministry. He was also a lawyer. He had a varied career in some 60 years or so of life. And I wondered when I was reading this with some more understanding than I did when I read it and studied it in high school. Then we were studying it from the literature side. Here I began to understand more. And that's why it, it, the thought was triggered in my mind this week about this point. Uh, because I began to understand in my mind, in my heart more, that this is... There's a religious side to this poem also. We, nobody, the most insignificant person around us is not insignificant. 
They're all a part of mankind. They're all a part of God's children. We have to treat them as if they were God's children. We have to treat them, hmm, this might be a danger, <laughs> as if they're our own brother, because they are. When we come to Christ and they come to Christ, we become brother and sister in Christ. No longer are we separated by the sins that we have done, but all of our sins have been washed clean in Christ and through his blood. And they become our brother. They become our sister. And we need to show them the same love and concern as we do for our own brothers and sisters. Most of us, I've got two sisters still alive. I had, well, I had a brother who was killed in 1980, as I mentioned earlier. But my two sisters, we don't see each other that often. Every year or so, I think I'd been almost, I'd been a little over a year when I saw them this last September, I guess. Yeah, it was in the latter part of September that we were all together there in Central Florida. But there's a difference. I feel a difference. Have you ever gone to another church somewhere and felt that you were in the presence of God? by the way the people treated you? Hopefully you have. I know that I have. And that's what, folks, let's, let's strive that in our church that we don't, we're, we're not going to walk in to church on Sunday morning and walk into the vestibule and pull out a gun and kill somebody just for the heck of it. We're not going to do that. But do you realize that we can kill them by our words? We can kill them by our actions? We never know. Just as you never advertise. We don't walk around with a billboard up on top of our head with a running sign across there saying, Walter's suffering from depression this week. Walter's got a broken arm this week. We don't know any of that. We don't know what the other people are going through. We don't have a clue. But by the way we treat them, we can either help or we can hurt what they're doing and what they're going through. I've been reading recently, rereading, actually. I've read it several times before. I don't remember how many. Some of you can tell, could have read the same book. And I won't mention the name in a minute. And some of you have will be able to tell me. I read it five times. I read it one time. I read it ten times. I don't know how many times I've read it. I have a habit when I've read something. A lot of times I pick one up and I read a piece of it. But this time I have been reading in its entirety. And I'm almost through with it now. An edition of In His Steps by Charles M. Shelton. And it's, if you read that and your, your mind is really open to being what God wants you to be, and if you read In His Steps by Charles M. Sheldon, I guarantee you, you're going to be changed. You're going to look at people differently. You remember, how long ago was it? 15, 20, 30 years? I don't know now. But everybody had these little bracelets, WWJD, WWJD. And we saw that everywhere. What would Jesus do? And that's the question that I've been asking myself since rereading In His Steps by Charles M. Sheldon. If you've never read it, please find a copy of it and read it. It's a wonderful story. It's it's not hard to read, but I guarantee you, if you don't have a true heart of stone, like some of you accuse me of having, but if you don't have a true heart of stone, you're going to come away changed by that book. Created in the image of God, we are designed. God created us in his image. 
Think about that the next time you're tempted to do something wrong. Would God do it? What would Jesus do? What would God do in your place? But we are designed to embody this living, loving, life-giving way of being with one another. We had the privilege a couple of days this week of hosting one of Emily's cousins from the Detroit area. And, and actually it was Emily's second cousin. Emily was closer to this girl's mom and dad. I say girl, she's in her late 50s, perhaps early 60s. But she has cancer. I mentioned her in a prayer request recently for she and her husband both. He has pancreatic cancer and she has a cancer that has gone all through her body. And she came into town. She had a bunch of, of family around here. She's got family on her dad's side up in Cookville and they're up there now. But we had the privilege of hosting them for two nights. When she got here, she frankly was in such bad shape that we looked at each other and later on, Emily and I talked about it and we were, we were concerned that she might not make it here. But when she announced this trip, it was a bucket trip for her. She wanted to come and see her family here one more time. We had the opportunity last night, 45 of us gathered together and had a potluck meal. And she got to see people she hadn't seen in years. She got to see some people she'd never seen because they were too young the last time she was here. But anyway, we had a privilege of taking care of them. And I could tell her, we, we had never known them. I mean, we knew them. We knew who they were, but we didn't really know them. But we feel like we do now. And I could really look at them and tell them that I love them. I'm not talking about a sexual kind of love, but in the love of Christ through me. And I'm, I'm not talking about me being so good. I'm just saying life is so much better if we allow God to come in. When they were leaving today, as they were driving out, I told her, I said, Susie, if I don't see you again here, and I pointed to the earth, I'll see you up there. And she nodded, yes. And isn't it, it's great that we can be that way with those of family, even though it's, it's distant. There's several people between us, but they're family. But you know what? Everyone that comes into our church is family. And we need to look at them with the same love and compassion that we would have for our own family. By the way, speaking of that again, and I see by the clock that it's time to go. Don't forget, this is Sunday. This lesson is scheduled for Sunday, the 25th of October. One week from tomorrow. Uh, no. Anyway, <laughs> one week from Sunday the 25th. I've, I've pre-recorded this and, it, and it's being set up so that you can see it on Sunday. But one week from tomorrow, we will be having Sunday school class in person. Again, if you're comfortable with coming, we would love to have you with us. I will be recording the session and then it will be distributed shortly after this, the Sunday school hour is over. I'm not sure exactly when. I'll be letting you know sometime this week, but I will be recording it and show you where you can find it. We still will be on Facebook or we will be on YouTube, either one of the two. But if you're comfortable, come and be with us. If not, continue to be with us through these this time. I'm glad. It's been a privilege for me. It's been different. It's 
It's been difficult sometimes, but it's been a privilege for me to be able to be of use. And I hope that what I've done, I know one thing, I've grown this six or seven months that we've been out of class, but I am looking forward to seeing some of you on Sunday, November the 1st at 9.30 a.m. Love you all. Glad that you were with us today. Thank you. May God bless you and keep you through the week ahead. Mm -hmm.